for us? Sure. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth, the encouragement, the challenging um, instructions. Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear and uh, teach each one of us what you want for us as individuals tonight. We pray that you'd be with the pastor as he presents this. Thank you for the study that he has done. We pray that it would be edifying to each of us tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. And Lord, we just want to lift up Michelle Sanborn to you right now and just ask that your hand would be upon her and that you would touch her body, Lord, if it's your will, to bring healing to her and help her to recover from this, and I pray you would. I know Richard is also asking us to pray for her salvation. I know he's uncertain about that and uh, doesn't really know uh, whether she is sincere in any, in any commitment that she has made in the past. So I do pray that you'll speak to her heart and uh, help her to see that if she hasn't given her heart and her life to you, that now is the time. And uh, just be with her and comfort her and give the doctors wisdom in helping her and treating her. And be with Richard and Rochelle and the rest of the family, uh, his brother especially, and uh, uh, the, the many grandchildren and so forth. We just pray that you would just touch them and uh, bring comfort to them and draw them to yourself this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're picking up our study in Revelation chapter 3. We're in verses 14 to 22. Today we're looking at the church of Laodicea, which represents the apostate church, or the lukewarm church as it's called, of the last day, starting about 1900 and coming up to the present time. The city of Laodicea was a very rich city. It was founded by Antiochus II in around 250 BC and named after his wife, whose name was Laodicea. It was located about 40 miles um, southeast of Philadelphia on the road to Colossae. So you know, we know about the Colossian church. So this is very close. Uh, to the church in Colossae. And again, this, this church was a very prosperous uh, church. It was in a very prosperous city. Uh, also at the intersection of three major highways. It was very successful um, financially. It was very successful commercially. Um, and it was filled with wealthy bankers and, um, you know, financiers. It was so rich that when the city was destroyed by an earthquake in about 60 AD, it was actually able to rebuild without any um, outside financial help. It was known throughout the ancient world for its beautiful black wool that was woven uh, into beautiful clothing. Had a huge stadium where they, you know, did a lot of entertaining, I suppose. Uh, they had theaters, they had lavish public baths, and they had shopping centers. It was sort of like many of the big cities of our own time, uh, where millions of dollars pass through hands every single day. But the city had one serious problem. And it was its drinking water. It had very uh, horrible drinking water. It, it didn't have a, a main a fresh water source close by. Its main water supplies were from hot springs that were about four to six miles away. And so they built this aqueduct that brought the water from the hot springs uh, uh, over to the city. The aqueduct was was close to the city of Hierapolis. And of course the water was was filled with all kinds of impurities. By the time it got to Laodicea, it wasn't hot anymore, obviously, right? 
Uh, but it wasn't cold either. Instead, it was, guess what? Lukewarm, that's right. And it could be that when Jesus referred to the Laodiceans as lukewarm, uh, being neither hot nor cold in verse 16, that it was actually a simile referring to these uh, to their drinking water that came from these hot springs. It was impure and it tasted really bad. So think of that in terms of the church and you kind of get an idea of what Jesus' view was of this church. Now it's thought that the church here was, was also wealthy. The city was wealthy. The church was wealthy too. And that's evidenced by the fact that among the present day ruins... There are three church buildings there dating back uh, to the early days of Christianity. But in spite of this church's wealth, nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, is known of the ministry of this church in, in the preaching of the gospel to the surrounding area or you know, anything else that the church might have done. Nothing is known. Unlike the church in Ephesus that was known for its ministry in the region. This church is known for nothing except what we read here in this letter written to them by Jesus. In speaking about Paul's ministry in Ephesus, Acts 19.10 says that, And this continued, that is his ministry, for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That was the, the impact that the church in Ephesus had in that region. But Laodicea, nothing, nothing. And in fact, it, it probably was because of the evangelistic outreach of the church of Ephesus that the church in Laodicea got its start. But as far as Laodicea goes, again, we know of no such activity, which is obviously a very poor commentary of this church and its ministry and would be a very poor commentary on any church and its ministry. Okay, so that's a little background on the church of the Laodiceans. Now let's get into the address and description of Jesus um, in verse 14, chapter 3. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now you'll remember that for the most part, the description uh, of Jesus in these letters is taken from the description of Jesus in chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. But in the case of the church in Philadelphia, we saw that wasn't true. Much of the description in Philadelphia's letter came actually from Isaiah chapter 22. And when we went through that, we pointed that out. And in the case of Laodicea, this description also does not come from chapter 1, except for the phrase faithful witness, which is mentioned in uh, Revelation 1 verse 5. So, so let's look now at what this letter says about Jesus. He was, first of all, notice, the Amen. Right? Verse 14. These things says the Amen. Now, we're all familiar with this word, right? Is anybody not familiar with the word Amen? I think we're all familiar with it. We say it when we close a prayer, or sometimes we say it when we want to sort of express our agreement with a, a meaningful statement that somebody else has made. We say, oh, you know, amen to that. But it's also a word that Jesus used frequently. In the, in the more modern versions of the Gospels, he begins many statements with the words, truly, truly, I say to you. you. Familiar with that phrase? Truly, truly, I say to you. The King James Version renders it, Verily, verily, I say to you. But actually, in the Greek, it's this word, Amen. Amen. This was like he's saying, Amen, amen, I say to you. 
It indicates that Jesus is saying something extremely important. That's the significance that it has when Jesus uses it. Amen, amen. Okay, pay attention. You know, your ears should be perking up at this point. So when you come to this word in the Gospels, pay careful attention. Because Jesus himself is underscoring that what he is saying is not only true, but it is really, really important. We use amen as sort of a last word, and it has that meaning too when God speaks. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. In other words, the promises of God are sort of a final word. You know, when God gives us a promise, it's a final word. You don't have to doubt it. Because he promised what he, he promised, then we can count on that. It's, it's like, well, it's better. It's better than being in the bank, you know. We say, take it to the bank. But it's better than that. Because God promised. There's no doubt about it. God will come through. He'll be true to his word. The book of Hebrews begins, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has the appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. And so Jesus has spoken to us and the word of Jesus is the last word the final word of God to man. Anyone who goes beyond the words of Jesus is not giving us new truth. He is departing from the final word that God has spoken through his son Jesus and probably giving out false teaching. Uh, always beware of people who say that they have new truth. There is no new truth. The truth has been already given to us. It's in the Bible. It's in the words of Jesus. We don't need any new truth. We have all the truth that we need, all the truth that God has chosen to uh, reveal to us. So Jesus is the amen. That means he's the final word. Now it says here, Jesus also describes himself as the faithful and true witness. Now there's, there's a, there's, you know, these are related, obviously. But this just gives us another aspect of what that means, I think. What does it mean to be the faithful and the true witness? Well, we see the same thing, if we turn ahead to Revelation chapter 19, in verse 11, where we see Jesus described as faithful and true as he returns to the earth riding on a white horse. It means that Jesus is a true witness of God. That is, if you want to know what God is like, and who doesn't? I think we all would like to know what God is like, right? Well, we don't, it's not a big mystery. It really isn't. All we have to do is look at Jesus. Jesus is essentially the exact representation of God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And then later on, uh, in uh, discussions with the Jews, Jesus said, I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. And then even later on yet, when Philip said in John 14, 8 to 9, Lord, show us the Father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? You see, he was a faithful witness of what God is. His life was a witness to us of what God is and who God is. Now, it's interesting that the Lord calls us 
also to be his witnesses, right? That doesn't mean, doesn't just mean telling others about Jesus. It, it should be that men would be able to know what Jesus is like by looking at our lives. That's how Jesus revealed God to us. And that's the way we should, we should live our lives in such a way that when people see us, you see, you see that? That's just the tremendous responsibility there, isn't it? And, and in those areas where our lives are not really a true reflection of Jesus, we're, we're not true witnesses like he is. He's the faithful and the true witness. But when we live our lives in such a way that Jesus is obscured or not seen at all, then we are not the faithful and the true witnesses. So, so it's really an obligation, isn't it? It's a tremendous responsibility and an obligation that we carry to be his witnesses. And of course, we can only do it through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses uh, to me. But again, you can't do it apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So this is something that we need to, I think in our lives need to have a daily focus on. And it's a daily prayer. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, to have the power today to live for you. We can't do it apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus was the faithful and the true witness. He was a faithful and true witness. He never failed in being a witness of who God is. And then it says, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now this third phrase is not as the uh, New International Version puts it, the ruler of God's creation. I think that's really a very poor translation. It should really be translated the beginning of God's creation or better yet, the origin of God's creation. Jesus wasn't the first thing that God created. He is the origin of all creation. It, it's the same word that the Gospel of John opens with. We mentioned it a moment ago. In the beginning, or in the origin, was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And two verses later, uh, verse 3, it says, All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. The word means beginning, or origin, or the person or the thing that commences. In other words, Jesus is the origin of it all. He is the one who, who began God's creation. He made it all. But not merely the old creation, like the, the physical universe in which we live, including the great galaxies of space, uh, the planetary system of our sun and the earth itself. That's not all. He created all all came all of that came from the hands of Jesus as the source of God's creation I mean can you imagine the power the power of it all that he would was able to create everything but that's not all he created and that's not all he creates he continues to create today what are you talking about? Jesus is the source of the new creation that God is building. Paul, uh, what is that? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are part of a new world that Jesus is bringing into being. It has already begun, that's the point. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. We as individuals are a new creation, and we as a church are a 
new creation that God is making through his son, Jesus Christ. And to that I say, amen. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Praise the Lord. So let's look at this just for a second, devotionally. Jesus is the amen. Another way to say amen is so let it be. And so because he is the amen, everything that he has decreed will be done without fail, right? Jesus is the faithful and true witness. Everything he says is absolutely true. And we can rely on what he says without any hesitation whatsoever. So he's the amen, he's the faithful and true witness, and he's the beginning of the creation of God. He started it all, he is the beginner, and since he created all things, he is also over all things, right? There is nothing that is not under his control. He's omnipotent. And on top of all of that, the Bible declares elsewhere that he is love. So how can we lose? <laughs> Jesus wins it all, and he gives us the daily victory when we place our trust in him, when we come to him on a, on a daily basis, we surrender our lives. He gives us the daily victory. He fills us with his Holy Spirit. He gives us the ability to do those things that are really, 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 really hard for us to do. He gives us the ability to do them. So we just need to ask him to help us to place our complete and total trust in Him. He can help us to set aside the feelings of anxiety and, and depression and the feelings of being burdened. He can help us to rest in His peace. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. And then He says, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He is the Amen. He is the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, and He is love. You can't go wrong with that combination. It's a perfect combination. Well, that's what Jesus is. But what about this church? Yeah, okay. That brings us to the accusation, verses 15 to 17. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Now notice we go in this case from the description of Jesus to the accusation against the church. What's missing here? I'll comment that, uh, where they get commended for something. That's right, the approval. There's no approval. He goes right from the description to the accusation. There is no, nothing good said about this church. No approval. Much like the dead church of Sardis, there is no approval for this church. He has nothing good to say about them or to them. That's not a position we want to be in, folks. We don't want to be in a position that when Jesus begins to comment on us, that he has nothing good to say, only bad. That's a scary place to be. So we probably should pay close attention then to what he says to this church, right? Because we don't want to be in the place of this church. He says, first of all, I know your works. I know your works. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but this is something that he is repeated to all seven of the churches. He's told all seven of them, this is the seventh one now, I know your works. Chapter 2, verse 2, verse 9, verse 13, verse 19, chapter 3, verse 1, 
chapter 3, verse 8, and now chapter 3, verse 15. So go back and check it. I'm not making it up. This is something he says to all the churches. I know your works. Seven times he says, I know your works. Jesus was aware of their works and has seen that they are not commendable. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All things. So we don't, we, we don't hide anything from God. We can't hide anything from God. God sees it all. And, and, and so he knows our works. And if we've been messing up, he knows it. And if we've been faithfully serving him, he knows it. We cannot pull the wool over the eyes of, you know, the all-seeing one, right? The things that we think are done in secret are not done in secret. They're done openly before him. So that ought to, that ought to cause us to hesitate and to reconsider. But so often it doesn't. It doesn't. Sometimes we, we just run around doing stuff that is stupid stuff. And, you know, we, we don't take into account that God is seeing all of these things. That he, he's, he, it's, you know, it's not getting by him. He pays attention. And he's grieved oftentimes by it. He's blessed when we do things that we should be doing, too. He notices that. He's not just the guy that notices the bad but doesn't notice the good like so many of us. He knows our works. And then he says that you are neither cold nor hot. Neither cold nor hot. There were two problems in this church. Probably more, but two, two mentioned. First, there was something wrong with their commitment. They were neither cold nor hot. They were, they were suffering from what someone has well called the leukemia of non-commitment. The cancer of non-commitment. The only thing they were committed to, essentially, was having a good time in church. They came to be entertained. They came to feel good. But this church was really nothing more than a religious country club. And also, there was something wrong with their self-image, as we'll see in verse 17. They thought they were rich, but they were really poor. They had a, a positive self-image, but it was completely wrong. Completely wrong. The church at Sardis was a cold church. It was a dead church. It, it was as cold as death. The church... At Philadelphia, it was hot. It was alive. It was vital. But here in Laodicea was a church that was neither hot nor cold. See the difference? It was merely lukewarm. As I mentioned earlier, the archaeologists have discovered an interesting fact about this city. It had no local water supply, but they again obtained their water uh, through an aqueduct from the hot springs there that were close to Hierapolis. And if you were staying in a motel in Laodicea and turned on the tap, assuming that there was one, turned on the tap to get a cold drink and tasted the water, you would probably spit it out again because it, it was tepid. It was lukewarm and it tasted horrible. Traveling that distance... The hot water had obviously partly cooled down and would be nauseating and repulsive. And so the Lord says in verse 16 that he would vomit out the church because it was nauseating to him. Imagine that. What created this condition? Well, there's only one answer, I think. Compromise. It's compromise. When you want to make something lukewarm, what do you have to do? You have to mix together hot and cold, right? We do this continually with air temperature. We, we, we know how to do this. You know, 
uh, if it's too hot, what do we do? We turn on the air conditioner. And what's happening there when we're turning on the air conditioner is we're mixing the hot air with the cool air to bring the temperature down to a comfortable temperature for us. If it's too cold, then we turn on the heater and we mix the cool air with the hot air to then bring the temperature up. And when it comes to heating and air conditioning, of course, that's a good thing. But when it comes to spiritual vitality, it is a horrible thing. That's what this church was doing. They were compromising spirituality for comfort's sake. It is much more comfortable to attend a church where nobody takes doctrinal issues very seriously. Where, for comfort's sake, you avoid discussions over issues like godly living and sin. You avoid, you never mention the word repentance because that would mean that there's sin that has to be repented of. And you don't ever want to mention that word sin. This church was compromising its teaching, I believe, for the sake of peace. You could have attended this church for years and it would probably have been a very nice experience probably been very pleasurable but nothing much would be happening really from an eternal perspective you would not be challenged you would not be rebuked or corrected or exhorted but only encouraged and respected because it was a comfortable church I've had people come to me before in, in years past I don't think it's happened since I've been here uh, but in, in previous churches I've had people come to me and it was particularly at a time when I was had taught that Sunday and and somebody who was new to the church came up to me afterwards and said you know you you know what you said about so and so and so and so that was just uncalled for that was just not necessary I came to church today to feel good and of course it wasn't a good time for me to bring any correction at that point but what I wanted to say was well, okay, sorry about that, but uh, you know, I, I didn't come here to make you feel good. I came here to teach you, you know, what God's word is and what his will is for our lives. And you know what they say about when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs? The one that yelps the loudest is generally the one that got hit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that he was a dog, but nevertheless, the, you get the point. You know, I must have said something in that message that, you know, got him mad. So, yeah. So, but this church was not a church like that. It was a very comfortable church. It, it was a very uh, happy, feel good kind of church. And when you left that church, you'd feel good about yourself. No matter what kind of sin you might have been involved in, you still felt good about yourself, you know. Uh, it was a, but it was a compromising church. So what does Jesus think of a church like that? It's important that we think about that, you know. What does he think of a church like that? It makes him sick makes them comfortable but it makes him sick but look at their view of themselves their self-image verse 17 again because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing that was what they thought of themselves what a sad condition this is there is a big problem you see between you say and you are. You say that you're rich. You say that you're wealthy. You say that you have need of nothing. But there's a big, big difference in what you say about yourself and what you actually are. Well, not always. I mean, sometimes we tell the truth to ourselves. And that's a good thing, right? But Jesus points this difference out. This is the faithful and true witness speaking, the one who tells the whole truth, even though it sometimes hurts. This church at Laodicea 
was to use a popular expression, fat, dumb, and happy. Fat, dumb, and happy. It was smug, it was self-sufficient, it was complacent, they had a lot of money, perhaps they had beautiful buildings, gifted preachers, a great choir, a great worship band, and the respect of the community. They thought they were doing well. And on the outside, it looked like they were enjoying success as a church. But when Jesus looks at it, he says, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Why such a difference in these two views? It's because they were being measured by two different standards. Two different standards. In May of 2008, my dad came here and visited with us from Southern California. Visited a few days. It was right after my mother had passed away. And he was not doing well from that. And uh, I felt that he needed a change of scenery. And so I said, Dad, let's go. Let's go up to Montana and see uh, Adam and Jen there. And, and uh, Debbie, I think you were already there, right? Yeah, and uh, Adam had come down to the service and had played the music at my mother's uh, memorial service. And so we all just went back and I said, Dad, you just come with us. And, and then when we're done there, Debbie had driven over, over there. And so we flew to the Billings and uh, first class on United Airlines. Listen, it was no big deal, don't worry. It was really <laughs> no big deal. It was just a little wider seat, that was it. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't believe that it was no big deal, but it really was no big deal. Anyways, um, we, we, we got to Billings, we visited for a little bit, and we all, the three of us got in the car, and we drove back here, and Dad stayed with us for a few days. While he was here, this was May, while he was here, it was about 60 degrees every day. And he kept complaining about how cold it was. I mean, every day he would tell me how cold it was and how he hated the cold. I couldn't understand it, you know, because we had just come off a pretty long and hard winter uh, and, and 60 degrees felt really good to me. So what was the problem? Well, we were using different standards in evaluating the temperature outside, right? His standard was almost always sunny Southern California. He was used to an inside temperature of 80 degrees, and he loved it. He loved it when we would go visit him. It would be 80 degrees in the house, and he's just a happy camper, and I'm just, just sweating like crazy. And finally, I have to practically go. I feel like I'm begging him to say, Dad, can I turn on the air conditioner? He'd say, okay. Okay, you know, reluctantly. Because he knew it was going to get cold and he was, it was going to come down to 75 and he would be cold. <laughs> My standard was a very long, cold winter with lots of snow. His standard was sunny Southern California. And if you use two different standards of measurement, you will never be able to agree on how to evaluate what the temperature is, right? And that's what was happening here. They were being measured by two different standards. Laodicea was using the standards of the world. It was pleasant, comfortable, approved by the community around, and they thought they were doing well. But Jesus is using a different standard. Jesus is using the standard of what he intended for his church to be like. And it is definitely not to be a country club run for the benefit of its members. It's not a performing arts theater either, where people are entertained with wonderful music. It doesn't mean you can't have good music in church. You can have great music in church. 
but it's not for the purpose of entertainment it's for the purpose of drawing people into worship it's not to be a political action group either taking sides on the issues of the day of course there are important sides to be taken when they touch on biblical issues and we should do that but we're not here to be a political action group and and it's we're not here to be a protest movement there are certain things we should protest yes but that's not our, our purpose is not to be a protest movement elements of all of these things may at times be legitimately expressed in the church but none is to be the purpose for which it exists Jesus tells us plainly what his church is to be like it is to be salt and not just plain salt but salty salt he said salt that loses its saltiness is good for nothing Matthew 5 13 it will only be he said cast out and trodden under the feet of men but a church that is salt should be salty he means that like salt in food it should be spread throughout the whole area flavoring and preserving whatever it touches the church is to function not only when it meets on Sunday but out where the people are during the week in businesses and offices and the marketplaces and shops in your home wherever you happen to be that is really where the church does its work outside the walls of the building that we call the church that that's where it, it's to tell the good news and to be salt flavoring life with a different flavor a different attitude towards circumstances it's a flavor that doesn't go along with the the willful and the wicked and the selfish ways of the world but a, f a flavor which chooses to walk in truth in righteousness and love and honesty this is how the church becomes salt filled with good works and it is also to be light jesus said you are like a city set on a hill you are the light of the world he said matthew 5 14. light is a symbol of truth the church is to be a source of truth and a vision it is the church that's charged with the task of helping people understand the program of god throughout history and of interpreting the events of the day so that men see what god is doing and how that applies to our lives this is the work of the church to declare the truth about man's lost condition and the good news that a savior has been born and will save us from our sin judged by that standard see laodicea had nothing they thought they had it all but jesus said that they were it was as though they were stripped naked poor pitiful wretched and blind and because they were blind they couldn't see what they really were and they couldn't see the enemy was actually right in their midst defeating them and rendering them ineffective back in 1995 china was um, offering to export a weapon that used laser beams to damage the eyes of enemy combatants it was called the zm-47 portable laser disturber one of its major applications was to injure or to dizzy the the eyes of an enemy combatant with these high power laser pulses and especially anybody who is sighting and firing uh, with an optical instrument so as to cause him to lose basically combat ability or, or result in not being able to see to use his ability to to do his job and the weapon was effective to a range of two miles 
So if they knew where to aim it, it's pretty uh, impressive. And the result, of course, is that a blind soldier is worthless for battle. Satan knows. And so he does what he can to blind even believers and render them ineffective. If he can't get them to join the world, he'll at least do whatever he can to sterilize their impact on anybody else. Okay, let's look at the application. Verses 18. Admonition? The admonition. Sorry about that. Admonition. Verses 18 and 19. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and then anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. So first he says to buy from him gold refined in the fire. Now what does this mean? Well, I think it, it means real faith. Real faith, a genuine faith. A faith that works. 1 Peter 1.7 says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found at praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1, 1 Timothy 6.18 and James 2.5 also lend credence to that interpretation. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.18 says, Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. James 2, 5, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? I think he's saying, come to me and just give me yourself and I'll give you a pure faith, a true faith, a proven faith, that is priceless. It's like priceless gold. What does that mean? It means a real relationship with Christ, a genuine belief that affirms that you're a true Christian. Then he says to buy white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. In other words, get rid of the ones that you have now, which are really as good as nothing. Get a beautiful white robe. That's the, that's the style in heaven, apparently. A beautiful white robe. Back in Isaiah 61.10, Isaiah said that God wants to clothe us with the robe of righteousness. We know in Revelation 3.4, he said that people who walk with the Lord will walk with him in white, for they are worthy. Over in Revelation 7, 9, we see the saved multitude. And what are they wearing? White robes, that's right. Over in Revelation 19, verse 8, it says that the wife of the Lamb is clothed in fine linen, white or bright and clean, and this fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So he says, I'll give you a true faith, a pure faith, a saving faith, a confident faith, and then I will give you righteousness. I'll give you a righteous nature, and I'll give you righteous acts. I will help you by the power of my Holy Spirit for you to live righteously. And then he says, to anoint your eyes Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Laodicea, now here's an interesting thing. Laodicea was noted for their eye ointment. It was sold all over the world as a cure for various eye problems. And yet recently, I'm not sure how they, they came about this, but they duplicated the formula. And they tested it and found that it has absolutely no medicinal value at all. It was, in a sense, 
snake oil. <laughs> but Jesus says they need spiritual eye salve that will enable them to see. In other words, they were selling this phony baloney stuff, but Jesus said, I can give you something that will help you to see spiritually. In many places in Scripture, we have mention of an anointing of the Spirit which opens eyes, right? To see and to understand the truth of God. John speaks of this in his first letter, 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all these things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. He's talking there of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the ISAF that opens our eyes and helps us to see. Isn't it interesting that the, the Bible also says that Satan has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Satan has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever so that they cannot see. God says, I have an eye salve for you. It's going to remove that blindness. It starts off with the Holy Spirit working with you. Remember the three relationships that we can have with the Holy Spirit. We've talked about this in previous teachings on the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit is with us. Before we're Christians, the Holy Spirit is with us and He's trying to draw us to Jesus Christ. And then when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes in us. And then after we've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit is in us. If we ask Him, the Holy Spirit will then come upon us. See, there's three different prepositions there, right? The Holy Spirit with, the Holy Spirit in, and the Holy Spirit upon. It's the Holy Spirit with us that is helping to remove the blinders and give us the ability to see spiritual truth. See that God really loves us and that we really are sinners and we really need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit comes into us, it's proof that we have given our lives to Jesus and we now belong to Him. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as sort of a down payment, uh, the Scripture says, for what is yet to come in the future, heaven for, for those who you know, walk with the Lord, right? And then when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that's what Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And we desperately need that every single day in order for us to to be able to live for, for Jesus. Uh, now he says in that 1 John passage 2.27 that um, as the, he says, as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it has been taught you, you will abide in him. That just because we have that, the Holy Spirit is teaching us the anointing of the Spirit doesn't mean we don't need teachers. We don't need human teachers. It doesn't do away with that. It means that unless the Spirit is in you, opening your eyes to the meaning of the truth that is taught, then it will fall on deaf ears. So we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. And the way He does that is by bringing teachers who are teaching the real Word of God to us. And then while we're being taught that Word, He is moving upon our minds and upon our hearts so that we can recognize this is the truth because it's based on the Word of God not on man's opinion. So if we, if we have the Spirit of Christ within us then our eyes are opened to understand the Word of God and we see the Bible in a, in a new, fresh and wonderful way. Before you were a Christian when you read the Bible I mean, did... Uh, did it mean anything to you, you know? 
Uh, we had a Bible. We had a couple of Bibles in our home, and I picked it. I remember one time as a young guy thinking to myself, you know, we've got this Bible here. I should probably read it. And so I picked it up, and I thought, well, why should I read it? Thought, well, the, I'll start the same place you start any book, right? At the beginning. <laughs> so I started reading Genesis. Chapter 1 was pretty interesting. Chapter 2 was interesting. Chapter 3 was interesting. Then it started to get a little shaky a little bit there when it's talking about um, you know what's his name the, the Tower of Babel and all that and that guy and then it started to get interesting again when it was talking about Noah and then after chapter 11 it was like I'm not you know this isn't I'm, I'm not getting this it was like didn't didn't really gel with me why is that cuz I mean it was interesting because it was interesting it would be interesting to anybody to read about the creation of the world, I think. At least it's to me. But then when you start just getting into the history of some obscure people that I'd never heard of before, eh, not so interesting anymore, you know. But it, really the problem is, is that I didn't have the Holy Spirit enlightening me, opening up my eyes, helping me to see. I was just reading a book because it was there and I thought I should. But I didn't have any real spiritual yearning. So, you know, even as Christians, we sometimes have a hard time reading our Bibles, especially when we get to, like, Leviticus or some parts of, you know, Deuteronomy, you know, the latter chapters of Exodus. I mean, I get it. Sometimes it isn't, it isn't easy reading. And so I ask you, if you're having a hard time reading your Bible, you know, is it hard going? Uh, is it difficult to understand? If it is, then I, here's, 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 how I, here's my answer to you about that. Here's what you should do. Pray and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit and give you understanding. And it's amazing that, that he'll, he'll do that, you know. Anyways, and then even to this lukewarm apostate church, he says this, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. In other words, there's, there's hope. There's hope even for a church like this. Even for a church full of these kinds of people. And if there's a hope for them, there's a hope for us. Doesn't matter how bad we, we mess up. You know, we go through those periods of time when we're not really trusting in the Lord. We're trusting in our circumstances. We're trusting, you know, in, in whatever, but we're not trusting the Lord. You say, oh gosh, I've blown it so many times. I know, I have too. Blown it so many times. But we can come back because he is, He's the God of second and third and fourth and 122nd and 5,083rd. <laughs> You know, I mean, it sounds funny, but it's true. It's true. There's hope even for this church of unbelievers. So there's hope for us. Yes, he's been hard on them. Yes, I mean, it's true. It's pretty harsh, some of the things that he's said to them. He's rebuked them. He's chastened them. But why? Why? Why did he do it? Because he's an all-powerful, you know, bad guy? No, because he loves them. He rebukes them because he loves them. He chastens them because he loves them. That's what it says there. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Sometimes love has to do that. It has to rebuke. It has to chasten. We don't like rebuke. <laughs> we don't mind it as long as we're on the giving end of it. <laughs> but we don't, we don't like to be on the receiving end of it, you know? But you can't deny that God does that to us at times. He does. He rebukes us. He chastens us. And why? Because He loves us, right? Right? 
Hebrews 12, this is the famous passage on this subject. Hebrews 12, 5 to 6, and you have, have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And notice this, and scourges, that's pretty harsh, huh? Scourges every son whom he receives. He scourges every son, not who he's casting off, not who he's throwing away, saying, oh, I give up on that one. He scourges the one whom he receives. Why does he do it? Because he wants us back. He wants us back. And the answer, of course, when God chastens us, is that we should be zealous to repent from our sin and turn to God. Which leads us to this beautiful promise and this exhortation. Look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You see, Jesus was not inside this church. He was outside. Does that blow your mind? Yes. They were functioning day by day, calling themselves a church, but they weren't really a church. A church is only a church when Jesus is in the midst, right? But he wasn't in the midst of these folks. He was on the outside looking in. Unfortunately, that is true for so many people today. They are spiritually blind. They are blindly following blind leaders. And this, this really is the apostate church today. There are many, many churches today that have hired homosexual and lesbian pastors. There are many churches today where there is a total denial of the Bible as the Word of God, the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ, the denial of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And you wonder, why do they even exist? They, you know, it's so obvious that they're not Christian. I mean, if they want to be an organization, fine. It's a free country, right? You can have these kinds of organizations. But why do they want to, why do they insist on calling themselves Christian? Because they know that they're not. Why do they exist? Well, they exist for a lot of reasons, I suppose. Maybe because they provide jobs for people. They provide a social club where people can come together and feel good. You know, hang out with other people that, that, that you know, are like them. And maybe they provide a political action committee to influence society towards uh, ungodly values. But even after all this, even after all this, he asks them to invite him in. Wow. And if they'll invite him in, he says he'll come in. And he'll have fellowship with them and they with him. Verse 20 is one of the finest explanations, I think, in the whole Bible of how to become a Christian. It has three simple divisions. First, there, there comes a sense that Christ is outside of your life and knocking at the door of your heart, wanting to come in. That, that occurs when you realize that your life is not what it should be. When you feel empty and disturbed about your situation yourself. You hear the good news about Jesus, the kind of Lord that he is, what he can do, and something within you responds. That is exactly what happened to me on the night that I was converted. I realized that I was missing something really, really, really important in my life. And I found out that Jesus could meet that need. You sense the knocking of Christ. And you want him to come in. You long for him to come in. 
and you begin to be awakened to your need and you sense him offering to enter your life. That is step number one. Then the second step is very important. You have to open the door. He will not open it. He will not open it. He is not going to force himself upon us. He never forces anyone into salvation. He offers it to us. Everywhere in Scripture, Jesus offers himself to men and women. And he grieves over the fact that people do not receive his offer. So he offers himself here. He says, if you will open the door, you must invite him in. You have to open the door. You must say to him, come in, Lord Jesus. Enter my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Deliver me from my sins. And deliver me from myself. Then the third step is very clear. Very, very clear. He will enter in. He will enter. We invite him. He comes in. He says so. Now, now this is a very important point, and I want you to, I want you to hear me on this. You don't have to feel him enter. You don't have to have goosebumps when he enters. He doesn't say he will give you the feeling that he is there. Although certainly that will come in time. I believe it. I believe it will. But when you ask him to come in, he comes in whether you feel it or not. He says, if you open the door, I will enter in and remain with you. We will eat together and be together. We'll fellowship together. That's what his promise is. It's really a beautiful picture of permanently dwelling with you. You don't have to feel it. You just have to know it. Because he promised it and said he will do it. That should be good enough for us. So whether we feel it or not, did we ask him in? Yes. Okay, then he came in. And he is there in you. It's a beautiful picture of him living with you. He will move in to live with you and to help you change into what he wants you to be. And all you have to do is ask him. Ask him to come in. And then once he's in, in when he is in when you ask him, then from that point on you just ask him for help every day. And he, he provides it. He will give it. Then he talks about being an overcomer in verse 21. Look at that. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And I also, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. So today Jesus is sitting at the throne of God in heaven. Right? Now, here's, here's the mind-blowing thing. He gives the offer to us to do the same thing. Those that would be overcomers. He says that they would be able to share and sit with him on his throne, even as he sits with his Father in his throne. Usually when we think of going to heaven, you know, we think of, you know, we're there worshiping, we're bowing down, you know, uh, and, you know, we're before the throne, worshiping God, just uh, totally amazed that we're there, right? I mean, it's just, a, you know, if, if our minds could be blown in heaven, they would be blown for sure there, right? Unlike anything here. But he, he, he says, he takes it to a different level. He says, not only will you be before the throne, but you will sit on the throne, Wow! <laughs> Is that amazing or what? That we could sit with Jesus on his throne. It's got to be a pretty big throne, right? When you think about it, it's really unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. But remember who said it. Remember who said it. Who said it? Yes, the Amen. The faithful and the true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. And if he said it, folks, it's got to be true. It's got to be true. Something each and every one of us can look forward to.
Finally, verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I don't need to say another word about that because we know what it means, right? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. And even as we read about this church that is just not really a church, they call themselves a church, but they're really no more than a social club. Nothing wrong with social clubs, but they're not churches. Even as you speak to this church that has gone so far astray, yet you tell them at the end, hey, it's not too late. You can still repent. You can still come back. You can still invite me in. And if you do, and if you will, and I will come in. So that just tells me, Lord, that it doesn't matter how far we may have fallen. That if we'll come back to you, you will receive us. And that you will begin to work again in our lives. That you will help us to be what you want us to be. Just as you were the faithful and the true witness, you will help us to be the same. And so I pray that you will. Uh, Lord, if, if there's any sin that we need to repent of, I pray that you'll reveal it to us and help us to do so. And I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you will help us to live for you each and every day. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.